Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, please uh, be seated and um, well, maybe people in the back can come down and sit in the front. Um, so it's a great pleasure um, to introduce the next keynote speaker of this conference. And, um, ah. Um, we have a double keynote session this morning, and uh, the first keynote speaker um, is Andrea Cusetti from Italy. And um, well, my co-chair just arrived in time to uh, introduce him, so I will give the floor to you. Good morning, everybody. And I first have to apologize that I was not on time. I had just had a horrible night. I will spare you the details. And then the alarm didn't ring. <laughs> it's just the nightmare scene you dream sometimes of, and it happened. But now we go over to the first keynote lecture, which will be given by Dr. Andrea Guzetta. He is a uh, he specialized in neuropsychology infantile, as so, as they so nicely can say in Italian. So that means he's a child neurologist and a child psychiatrist. He is uh, an associate professor at the University of Pisa, where at the Department of Clinical and Experimental Medicine. He's also the director of the infant neurology section and of the SMILE lab in the Stella Maris Foundation, which is also in Pisa. And I think most of you know him, and you know him also by his publications. If you look in PubMed, you see that he has about 150 papers, and they deal with early diagnosis, for instance, general movements, or with neuroimaging, such as um, dealing with children with cerebral palsy or autism spectrum disorder, and with early intervention. And that is today's topic. And he will focus, usually we think of action, but today he will focus on interaction. <coughs> and I think that's one of the basic human characteristics that we are there for the other. But the floor is now for Andrea, and we are really looking forward to your lecture. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Maina. Uh, thank you for being late. Uh, it's such a relief for an Italian if someone else is late. Um, uh, <clears throat> and thank you for the organizers for this amazing opportunity. I have to share some of my uh, research. Actually, I will... Um, uh, talk on behalf of many people that work with me um, in, at Stella Maris. Um, so um, I thank all of them. And um, uh, although I will not very much talk about my past research, but maybe more of on um, my current and what I would love to be my uh, future uh, research. Um, so early intervention is a topic of great interest. And uh, well, first of all, I have to uh, disclose my, um, I have no conflicts of interest uh, or relationship with companies. Um, it's, it's a very uh, hot topic at the moment. We are facing an amazing time because um, uh, we, uh, there, there, there's been a lot of progress in, uh, in clinical, um, um, uh, care about of uh, babies with brain damage in early detection of brain dam of uh, cerebral palsy of all neurodevelopmental disorders. So we are facing a great uh, time, but uh, still we can see that there are a lot of babies that need our help. This is a, a recent, um, just to give you a, a, a picture of what we are dealing with. This is a recent uh, review paper uh, showing how. Um, it's, it's a huge, uh, a huge, pay, huge review uh, that is showing us how uh, lesions can still uh, lead to impairment 
And the most common ones are, of course, cerebral palsy or uh, hearing loss, visual problems, and cognitive and developmental uh, problems. So from this review, we take home that the overall median risk in this paper was 39.4%, uh, so almost 40% of uh, infants um, across these studies had long-term neurodevelopmental abnormal outcomes. And so intrauterine neonatal insults have high risk of causing substantial long-term uh, neurological uh, morbidity. So as I said, we are facing an, a, a, an ex a, exciting time because uh, the diagnosis of these kind of disorders, especially cerebral palsy, but not only, uh, is kind of uh, moving uh, back in time. So we are uh, using new tools uh, more and more that tell us very early in development uh, what is the outcome of our babies, and particularly if our babies will develop cerebral palsy or not. And so this gives us a, a great opportunity for early intervention as a consequence. And certainly the two most uh, used tools that we can find in the literature are, of course, neuroimaging. Uh, we know MRI is very uh, predictive, and this is an example of a uh, um, baby with a preterm brain damage that was scanned at term. And you can see that the asymmetry of the uh, posterior limb of the internal capsule uh, is um, clearly telling us that this particular baby is going to develop a, a hemiplegia. And so we can imagine what it means to have a baby uh, at term age uh, and having already uh, uh, the knowledge that there is a very, very high risk of developing cerebral palsy. And this was um, shown by Linda DeVries many, many years ago now. Uh, <clears throat> another tool that is very useful, and we know from recent um, meta-analysis that it's uh, very powerful, is the GMs. So the general movements are a strong tool uh, to predict cerebral palsy. Uh, they can be highly predictive already during writhing periods or during the first weeks of life, even before term age, if babies develop consistently a cramp synchronized like the baby you see here. But uh, in some cases, you have to wait three months to see whether general movements are abnormal and do your uh, prediction of cerebral palsy. So still a very uh, early um, uh, time for assessment and for early intervention. Uh, so this was, uh, um, um, this reasoning was uh, at the basis of, of a big network international to, to write international clinical guidelines for early detection of high risk of cerebral palsy that were led by uh, Iona Novak, Nadia Badawi, Kathy Morgan in Australia, but it, it included a large number of people all, all over the world. And finally, the paper is coming out uh, so was accepted and is coming uh, out very soon and was the result of a common work uh, done by many, many different uh, professionals. So uh, people with CP, parents, service providers, doctors, therapists, and you name it, they're there. And the, the group of authors is also very large. And uh, this, is, uh, this is a bit disappointing because when you... When you have a paper that comes out, you usually call your friends, you know, and you say, oh, I've got this paper out, and, and uh, you make them jealous, but this, all my friends are here, so I cannot call them. <coughs> um, so if you, have a, if you have an early diagnosis, you can have uh, early intervention. And we know how that is, uh, uh, is very, very important uh, for uh, the outcome. We know, for example, from uh, studies uh, in animals, like those by uh, Kathy Friel and uh, Jack Martin in cats, for example, that the very first months are important, not only for, um, uh, in, uh, for uh, in the model of the uh, unilateral brain damage for restraining, for constraining one uh, arm, but also for training the other arm. So if you have an early training, you have really uh, good effects, at least in the animal models, at all levels uh, possible, um, up to the uh, molecular level, but also at a behavioral level. So the function is restored. So we know that we have to intervene early, and <clears throat> we know that uh, this can be done now, thanks to the fact that we have tools for an early detection of uh, these kind of disorders. 
And so there are a number of studies that are running, and I'm, I'm very privileged to be part of the game. There is a study, again, from the uh, Sydney group um, that is based on uh, um, training very early babies with uh, brain damage, but with a very high risk of cerebral palsy. So in the inclusion criteria of this study is having abnormal GMs uh, uh, before term or at term or at uh, three months. So basically almost 100% uh, uh, of the babies that are included in the study are very likely to develop cerebral palsy. So it's really testing intervention uh, in the very, uh, uh, the exact uh, field where you want to test it. Um, <clears throat> so using this, um, this project and many other projects that are, some other projects that are uh, out there base their uh, kind of rational on the idea that you need some uh, ingredients for early intervention. So you need uh, ingredients that are based from, on, on evidence from uh, neuroscience or empirical or from uh, other studies. So you need to be, to do the right way. So it is to be variable salient. It has to be fun to change your brain. Uh, you need the right content, so it has to be goal-directed, so based on moral learning, uh, the right target. <clears throat> so the target is not only the baby, it has to be the family. And the right time, so early, possibly, because there's a high neuroplasticity and you prevent maladaptive plasticity by doing it early. And of course it has to be intense. Uh, there is a dose issue that is probably the most difficult one to uh, cover, but it's, uh, it's there. And so all these aspects of the intervention lead to uh, one concept that is activity. So you need the baby to be active, to be active, the brain to be active in order to change itself. The brain needs to be active to change itself. But if we think of activity, and this is the title of this presentation from activity to interactivity, what is activity? What, uh, what is activity, especially in young babies? So at the very beginning of life, um, we can kind of break activity down into concepts like body movements. So body movements that are simple physical events, like extending the elbow, and then motor acts. Motor acts are more complex because they are movements that have a goal. So they are directed towards a goal. And actions are even more complex because their motor acts chain in sequential patterns in order to attain an overarching, more distal goal. So for example, grasping a glass uh, to drink. So I think that in activity, the, in, uh, in the word activity, the main concept uh, that needs to be stressed is the goal. So we need a goal. We need a goal to be active uh, as adults, but we also need a goal to be active as uh, babies from the very uh, from very early in time, and uh, so the goal is a state that needs to possess value for the system. So the goal is not just an end state, but needs to have a value; otherwise, it cannot be considered a goal. And so, in this concept of having values in our goal, is also uh, it, it's also very important for us as. Uh, uh, people that are involved in rehabilitation. Uh, <clears throat> so when does action start? It is amazing to see that there's some studies that show that uh, uh, the goal uh, somehow can be sort of uh, implied also in fetuses. So there are studies that show that, uh, like this one from uh, the group of uh, Umberto Castiello, that show that uh, um, there is action planning in the human fetus. So what they found is that by 22 weeks of gestation, the movements of the fetus uh, seem to show the recognizable form of intentional action with kinematics pattern that depend on the goal of the action. So basically, these fetuses had different kinematics if their hand was going to touch the mouth or the eyes, and probably they speculate that this is due to the fact that touching the eye might, be, um, uh, might give some sensory feedbacks that are different from touching the mouth. And another study, another group found out that more than um, half of the fetuses they observed um, showed our movements towards the mouth 
and the fetuses open their mouth before their hands come to contact with their mouth. So there is, uh, their speculation is that uh, there's an anticipatory kind of uh, behavior. But what is um, <clears throat> even more fascinating, although of course needs to be confirmed and studied more, is the idea that these goals are uh, basically social, so are, are really driven by interaction already at that time in, in, uh, in utero. And <clears throat> this was shown again with the same, in, in the same, uh, by the same group, uh, with, uh, in addition, Vittorio Gallese, who's uh, a neuroscientist studying uh, uh, intersubjectivity and empathy. And so they found that uh, actually uh, the, the soft movement, uh, the movement that has a kinematic uh, kinematics that uh, are softer, so are the ones that the fetus usually uses to touch their eye, are those that the fetus uh, kind of chooses to touch the conspecific. So instead of touching the conspecific with any kind of kinematics, it prefers to be very soft with his twin, which is kind of uh, interesting and fascinating. So. We have goals. We have goals from very early in life, from uh, probably the fetal time, but certainly after birth. And we do have goals as adults. And so in, it, it's central to our uh, experience to, um, to have goals. And so to be surrounded by people have uh, goals, and which means that they are uh, intentional agents. So when we see a movement around us, when we see uh, uh, some actions, we kind of infer automatically that there must be an intention behind it. And this was studied many years ago uh, <clears throat> by these um, psychologists who did a very fascinating study in, uh, well, it was 1944, so quite, quite a while ago, <clears throat> showing these um, kind of video to uh, young adults and asking to describe what they saw and basically uh, all of them uh, but one used uh, words that uh, that imply intention so they gave an intention to all these uh, geometrical figures and their point was we tend to give an intention to whatever is moving uh, probably the one who did not give intentions was the one that was not healthy um, uh, so, this idea of giving, uh, of having uh, understanding that uh, people that are surrounding us have intentions in their movements uh, is also present during development pretty early. And there are people like um, um, Dr. Woodward, Woodward who have studied this very thoroughly, and they found out that you pretty early during the first uh, three to uh, five months of life as a baby in typical development, you start to understand that the actions that are surrounding you actually are the result of an intention. So it's a kind of uh, mind reading, starting to understand intentions. And this was shown with this uh, paradigm that is very simple, is an habituation uh, paradigm. So you habituate your baby uh, to watch on a TV a uh, grasping of, for example, a teddy bear in this case, and then when the baby is habituated, you change uh, the stimulus. And it can be either a new goal trial or a new side trial. So if the baby finds novelty in the change of kinematics, we'll look at this more. If uh, the baby finds novelty not in change of kinematics, that's the same, but in change of goal, will look more at this. And that's actually what happens from five months onwards. So <clears throat> this, co this gives us the idea that uh, action, so developing our uh, motor function and developing our ability to produce actions is paralleled by the ability to understand the actions produced by others. So these two processes, understanding and producing actions, are kind of... Uh, uh, the same thing, and um, this, this again is was, was uh, kind of there, there are pieces of evidence to show that this is uh, the case. For example, we we, we did a systematic review recently uh, trying to see what are the studies in which 
brain representation of action observation can be described in infants with uh, neuroimaging or uh, uh, neurophysiology. And we found out that as early as four months, you can, with EEG, find that action observation and action production share some common uh, networks. But also, there are studies showing that um, um, the uh, development of action production is correlated with the development of action perception. So these two processes uh, kind of go uh, hand in hand in very, very early in development. So this is very important to keep in mind for us when we um, kind of uh, think of the targets of our intervention in babies with brain damage. So, for example, in these studies, they showed that there is a developmental correspondence between action prediction and motor ability in, uh, in early infancy. So, um, what they found is that the onset of inf infant's ability to predict the goal of others' actions was found to be synchronized with the onset of their own ability to perform that action. So what they did in this study was interesting because they studied longitudinally babies from four months up to 10 months, and then adults, and they exposed them to these kind of stimuli. So observing action, the first one was an action that was clearly intentional because it was meant to grasp the object. In this case, the action was just to touch, so there was no actual um, a, a explicit uh, uh, goal. And this action was, sorry, was done by a tool. And what you see here in, in this uh, graph is the three condition, one, two, and three at each age. And this is the time, the gaze arrival uh, at goal relative to arrival of action. So how early the gaze of the baby, the, the gaze of the baby uh, went on to the target, meaning how well the baby was predicting that that was the target. And as you can see, at four months, this is not present, but at six months, when the baby understands that is a uh, intentional action because the, the hand is positioned in a way that it's gonna grasp, is going to anticipate gaze. And this goes on and on until 10 months. And of course, as adults, we anticipate a goal even when the goal is not clear. But as babies, that's what we do. And what they found is that this is actually correlated with the actual ability of the baby. So um, the more unimanual and so the more independent uh, grasping was present as assessed by this alpha angle, uh, the more uh, able the baby was to anticipate the goal. So again, this tells us uh, this concept that um, producing actions and understanding action produced by others is a process that goes hand in hand. We need to have experience of actions in order to understand what other people are doing. And uh, this was also shown uh, looking at cortical responses from, uh, um, from yes, so from, from a, the point of view of uh, uh, brain activity, and in this study, uh, it's called You'll Never Crawl Alone, they found out that during EEG, that there was a correlation between crawling experience and the difference in move power between uh, crawling and walking videos. So the, uh, the move rhythm was interrupted, was affected more uh, looking at the crawling when the baby was actually able to crawl uh, and the walking when the baby was actually able to walk and not before. Meaning that we resonate with the action we are surrounded by uh, based on what is our own motor repertoire. Uh, other pieces of evidence are like um, experimental. So if you manipulate the, developmental, the development of action production you then, if this hypothesis is true, you then affect the development of action perception. And so that's what has been uh, done in this study, um, uh, Teach to Reach, in which they have used the uh, famous uh, sticky mittens in uh, babies. And so they had uh, an active condition and a passive condition. So by means of the sticky mittens, these babies were more effective in, in uh, actually 
uh, grasping the toy because the toy was naturally attached uh, to the hand as soon as the hand touched the toy. And, and the other experiment, the other condition, this was all passive, so dad was doing uh, everything. Toys are moved by the parent and do not stick to the middens. And so by doing this two-week training uh, and testing uh, how reaching was and also how uh, reaction to observing actions was, what they basically found out is that uh, uh, the babies that were trained, so they were practicing a more efficient grasping, were starting to understand better the grasping of others and were also more prone to grasp themselves the object even without a sticky mittens and to explore the object more. So by manipulating the development of these actions, you're actually manipulating also the ability of these babies to perceive the same actions and understand the same actions <coughs> in, uh, in others. Um, so, um, <coughs> This concept of mirroring is very interesting, and of course, it has received a lot of interest uh, some years ago when the, the, some, uh, some scientists uh, um, start, started to uh, develop a knowledge on uh, the mirror neuron system. So this system that apparently is there to uh, put together these two things. And basically, it is considered a system, of course it is more studied in animal models, but it is considered a system that basically is uh, there to code for the goal of the action. So that's the, 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 uh, the key word we, we talked about so far, and there is a system there in the brain that is coded, that is uh, there to code for the uh, goal of the action, and they've shown this, for example, showing that some neurons in the monkey both fire when you uh, do the action, when you observe the action, but they, code, they, they fire when the grasping action is made irrespective of how it is made, with one hand, the other, or the mouth, they always fire. So it's the goal that is coded by those. And in an even more interesting study uh, that uh, was done in 2008, they used a uh, tool to uh, 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 grasp a, a piece of um, uh, um, f uh, some food, but they, they used two types of tools that the goal was the same, grasping the food, but the, actually the action that was required was the opposite. So in one case you had to close your hand, the other case you had to, in the reverse tool, you had to open your hand to uh, get to the, uh, to the uh, to the food, uh, piece of food. And in both cases, of course, they found the same neurons firing. So it was a very clear evidence of the fact that in this area, F5 in the monkey, um, as part of the mirror neuron system, you have uh, cells that actually fire for the goal and code for the goal. And similar uh, findings were also obtained in humans, of course, with more um, uh, less, less precise tools like fMRI, for example, but also recently uh, it, uh, some um, people were able to also um, uh, test the single neuron responses uh, in humans during execution and observation of actions. And so they found that there, these properties are actually part of some specific neurons. Um, so um, we know that we have this system there. We have this system to uh, capture the goal of the actions, both our actions and uh, actions of people that are surround, uh, surrounding us. And so this system uh, is probably also useful in development to understand, to develop this understanding. And so to do what I, told, I said before, uh, develop in parallel motor function and motor understanding, understanding of motor actions. And probably uh, there is a, um, uh, the ontogeny of the neuro system is uh, still unknown. There is a lot of speculations and one idea is that probably there is a, an epigenetic kind of uh, uh, development. So during ontogeny, ontogeny specific social experiences pr produce changes in gene expression through epigenetic marks. 
uh, this could be a an hypothesis, and these epigenetic effects modify the pattern of neuronal wiring in the parallel uh, premotor uh, mirror circuits, and this is also um, can also be transferred to uh, phylogenetic uh, changes. So if the same social environment is present at each generation, a cascade of similar epigenetic events is produced in the newborn. And of course, every newborn is different uh, based on their own experience of observing actions. And so this um, uh, theory was so influential in uh, uh, trying to understand uh, cognitive development that uh, Dill Diamond some years ago um, wrote this paper saying that the discovery of mirror neurons provided a mechanism that could conceivably underlie newborn's ability uh, to show imitation, so to resonate motorically uh, with the environment. And of course, we know studies that are telling us, that are showing us um, imitation in monkeys. This is Pier Francesco Ferrari, who uh, studied monkeys for uh, many years now. Uh, this is a three-day monkey that is looking at the um, uh, observer and is about to be exposed to mouth opening. And the reaction will be... Um, a motor resonance that needs some time to develop because it's not, it's not, um, it's kind of a complex uh, mechanism. So I feel that this, this um, idea of this matching between uh, action production and observation can be a, um, a way to put together all those studies that are focused on action and those who focus on social cognitive function, as you know, usually labs do either one or the other, well, probably they are doing, uh, working with the same kind of stuff. So to summarize a little bit what I said, I will use the words by uh, Vittorio Gallese again, who is this um, neuroscientist from the group of Rizzolati who then developed his own research, especially on empathy and, and intersubjectivity. So what he says is that the phenomenal content of the intentional relations of others can be grasped by means of the activation of the mirroring mechanism. So when we see someone doing an action, uh, there is an intention behind that we can understand by activating these mirroring mechanisms. And what turns the acting bodies in our social world into goal-oriented selves like us is not first and foremost, an explicit inference to, by analogy, but the possibility of entertaining a we-centric, shared, meaningful, interpersonal space. So he sees, he's introducing this concept of a we-centric, uh, interpersonal space, and that is a, a, a very important concept for early development, and I believe it is also for early intervention. So this shared space is enabled by embodied uh, simulation, what he calls embodied simulation, a specific functional mechanism by which by means of which our brain-body system models in interaction with the world of others. So by resonating motorically with uh, the environment, we actually um, uh, develop um, our, uh, uh, we, 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 um, we develop our, our um, uh, cognition and both self and other appear to be intertwined because of the intercorporeity. So he goes even beyond the intersubjectivity using this uh, uh, word uh, that fits very well with the, uh, this hypothesis of embodied simulation that is intercorporeity that links them. So self-individuation in his view is a process originating from the necessity of disentangling the self from the we-centric dimension in which it is originally and constitutively embedded. So we are born as a we-centric uh, diet and we use the other for our development very much. And of course, it's no surprise that mother-infant interaction quality and infant's ability to encode actions as goal-directed are related. So the more there is a, uh, the better is mother-infant interaction, the better I will be as a baby in understanding what the others are doing. Uh, so of course, we know the quality of intersubjectivity in early in life is important. It's important from studies that um, uh, have explored uh, typical development or uh, uh, atypical conditions. 
Um, we know from typical development that timely and accurate response to the infant's communicative cues predicts positive social relationships, but also it enhances cognitive abilities. And we also know that sensitive caregiving during the first year is critical for the maturation of infant's uh, stress uh, response. Um, there are studies now, this is uh, December 2016, showing that mother-infant interaction correlates with uh, regional brain volume, so with actual structural uh, brain um, uh, volumes. Uh, what they did in this study was studying, uh, studying uh, dimensions of mother-infant interactions, uh, sensitivity, affect, communication, and they found out that lower maternal sensitivity was correlated with smaller subcortical gray matter volumes in the whole sample and this was similar in both sexes. Um, so there is a, um, a biological uh, base for the findings that have been out there for a long time, uh, correlating uh, early intersubjectivity and mother-infant interaction with outcome. And of course you have studies that show that disruption of early intersubjectivity uh, can lead to abnormal outcome. And, this is the very famous ERA study from Michael Rutter, who studied uh, um, children from Romania who were adopted in families from uh, England between 1992. And uh, he did a, an amazing job in following these babies uh, long term, so four, six, 11, 15 years. And so he, uh, he found out that, uh, of course, they have a lot of, they carry a lot of uh, consequences. Half of the children show long term persisting problems. And even when uh, subnutrition was not present, so it was not a nutrition problem, psychosocial deprivation had massive deleterious effects in these babies. And um, the most important prediction factor of later psychological problem was, not surprisingly, the age of the child when leaving uh, institutional uh, care. So we uh, have, um, again, of course, a lot of evidence showing that uh, this, is, uh, this is important. Uh, but the point is that babies with brain damage uh, are a vulnerable diet. So if we imagine uh, mom and, and baby, or dad and baby, the caregiver and the baby as uh, connected or in need of a connection that we uh, kind of saw it's so relevant for development, of course the condition of a baby with brain damage is uh, very uh, particularly, and it's, it puts both uh, elements of the diet into a very vulnerable condition. Uh, mom, of course, is, uh, or dad, will be uh, devastated by uh, the trauma of the lesion of what happened to the baby, and we know all the process they will go uh, through, and uh, they will have problems, therefore, to detect the signals from the baby and to produce significant signals for the baby. And the baby himself or herself, they will be also very um, poor, probably in most cases, in producing uh, significant and meaningful signals to mom and in detecting uh, mother's signals. So in this uh, connection, in this uh, dyad, uh, the connectivity is all disrupted. And so we have to, having known what is the, uh, the what is one possible model of uh, early development based on this inter interaction, very strong interaction, interconnection, and uh, this we-centered development, we have to take this into account when we have uh, these babies. And uh, what we propose as a model, or as a clinical model that we use is um, basically a model that focuses on these two aspects, what we call subjectivity, that is, uh, in a way, the well-being of baby and mom. So the well-being of the two elements, we have to take care of that. We have to take care specifically of that in a very specific and directed way, which means uh, by uh, providing support that is uh, uh, actual and it is part of the care of, of the baby. So it's not just referring mom to a psychiatrist, but is uh, having a psychiatrist in your team, if you know what I mean. And then, of course, uh, uh, the subjectivity of the baby. We know how these babies have severe problems usually in, for example, in uh, vision or in hearing. And so we have to be very careful in doing all we can in changing the environment to make it more friendly and to make it more easy for them to use their uh, uh, vision and hearing. And with the final goal 
of connecting the baby with uh, the mother. So we really have to model our intervention with this goal in mind, at least in the first, very first weeks and months of life in babies with uh, severe brain damage. And of course, the second focus is intersubjectivity. So um, uh, do all we can to um, uh, coach and, uh, mothers and fathers and help them in uh, these, uh, uh, this very hard task in these conditions, given the brain damage and all the consequences of brain damage to connect with their baby. So I believe that uh, this is, of course, something very important but is, and is, uh, is acknowledged by everyone, but probably just to finish and to leave you with some questions, we do not do enough to... Um, uh, not, do not do enough in our routine uh, intervention, early intervention programs to uh, cover that aspect. So I think we do, usually do not structure and reliably assess the quality of intersubjectivity. We generally, we don't use tools to do that. And we usually do not empower the families about the neuroscientific basis uh, of early intersubjectivity and neurodevelopment, of, uh, of neuroplasticity and intersubjectivity in neurodevelopment, which is, I think, something very important to, to use as a tool for them to understand and to uh, be on board in, uh, in the intervention. And we don't take action to specifically improve the quality of parent infant interaction. Uh, we usually don't do much to uh, uh, teach and help them in. Uh, learn with them about the uh, connections of that particular baby with that particular mother. And we do not test seriously the effects of our intervention as to the quality of parent infant interaction. Longitudinally, along the way, step by step, this is not usually a goal we have. Uh, we do not actively work uh, to remove the obstacles. Preventing a positive intersubjectivity is usually not a specific uh, goal. It's, it's kind of uh, there, but it's not. Uh, so specific as it, sh as it should be. So going back to uh, my first slide, when um, we said that these are amazing time, this is an amazing time, it is. It is because we are able to detect babies in high risk very early, we can do something. And it's also an amazing time because the world is coming together in networks and in uh, uh, large uh, multi-center studies that are really important to target this aspect of, uh, of our field. So how should an early intervention program be? So this is the right time to try to put more of the intersubjectivity uh, role in early development into the, uh, uh, the game. And my last slide, I would invite you all to a meeting we, are gonna, we organize with uh, Pier Francesco Ferrari, Rosario Monterosa, Lynn Murray in Sicily this year, later this year, 18, 21st of October. Um, that was called From Activity to Interactivity, Harnessing Early Adaptive Neuroplasticity for Intervention in Atypical Development. You can see some of the keynote speakers, and it's an amazing place. I don't know if some of you have been to Erisha in Sicily. It's really uh, stunning. And it will be four days. One day will be all dedicated to uh, visiting around. And four days will be all dedicated to eating a lot of good food. <laughs> and so I, uh, I'm going to see you there. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Andrea, for a very inspiring lecture on the new findings on the development of infant action and interaction. I think you gave us lots of food for thought, especially how we perhaps can implement what you told us into early intervention. Not that easy, I think, because there are many things we still do not understand. For instance, the Romanian study you talked about, I found one of the striking findings that uh, quite a large proportion of children did well, actually. Yeah.